Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the 30 minute chart of silver overlaid over gold. And you can see the big difference here between the direction that we have now going. Silver has now taken out that $20 price. You can see we're down around 1986. Whereas gold has rallied up to the highest price that it's been since about uh, mid-July or so. So you can see from the trend lines the clear direction of these two. Silver going down just like this in a very steady downtrend. Gold rising in a fairly steady uptrend. What's the, what is the result of this going to be? Well, in the past we've seen, you have to think of the psychology behind this. The psychology always works the same way. We have an international crisis which scares money into gold. At the same time, the threat of a deflation or a crisis always threatens the world economy and therefore the reasoning or the control of the paper manipulators making the reasoning look this way forces the price of silver down because economies may slow, whereas there will be a rush to safety into gold. So that's that's the standard explanation for this type of thing. We know in the past that they always come back together, either to the upside or the downside. Could we have a huge deflationary blowout? Yes, that could happen, and they could both collapse, or silver could catch up with gold. We just don't know. The politicians and the people who run the world today are in a corner and they're in very desperate situations where they are doing some very desperate things. So we don't know what they're planning. They seem to be planning a lot of things and hopefully most of their nefarious plans will fail. Now this is going to be a fairly long update because I have a lot to cover here. I just want to thank the members of the pay site, everybody who renewed and I apologize for the problems and not getting back to people. Again, if you have a problem logging in or there's some kind of payment issue, the big thing you have to remember with PayPal, if you signed up for a subscription with PayPal, then PayPal has a section which is your subscriptions. If you go into your settings and then you go into manage your renewing subscriptions, you can go into that area and you can see, and I advise everybody to do that anyway, because remember when you pay for something at PayPal, especially if it's some type of subscription type thing or membership type thing, it may automatically set to recurring. So go in there and check and do a listing of your recurring subscriptions. You can cancel them, you can suspend them, you can do whatever you want. And I check those fairly frequently because I have a number of recurring subscriptions. So that's the big thing is the PayPal thing. But if you do have password problems, we've had some glitches with people paying in other ways. Just bear with us as we get all those sorted out. And again, you can reach me at brotherjohnf at yahoo.com. You can also post on the contact page on the membership site. But if you can't get in, then you're just going to have to send me an email. So let's get into some of these stories. There's a lot of stories I want to cover. There's a similar sort of theme here. I'm going to rush through them because I have so much to cover. This is the latest with Argentina. We know that they defaulted. They didn't default because they had to. They defaulted because they chose to because of the vulture funds. And we've been through that. But let's read this analysis from Truman Factor. Last week on July 30th, the Republic of Argentina was declared to be in default for the third time in 30 years. Let's put that into perspective. If you were a bank officer who offered a 30-year mortgage to the government of Argentina in the early 90s, you would have spent nearly the entire life of the loan in a perpetual nightmare of refinancing. You would likely not only be fired from your job, but a pariah in the entire industry. This is what Argentina's international creditors and domestic citizens have faced in real life. At the time of this writing, at the time of the writing of this article, S&P has downgraded Argentina to triple C minus, one of the lowest ratings available for sovereign governments. The tragic history of sovereign defaults in Argentina expounds a vitally important lesson to all overly indebted countries, including the U.S., which do not want to face a similar fate. The inability for governments to pay back debt spill spells economic disaster, the road to default. 
after previous monetization of debt led to hyperinflation in the 1980s, which nearly evaporated the nation's savings and capital, Argentina was looking for something different. Sadly, they knocked on the wrong economic door. Rather than seeking a free market in money and credit, they opted for centralized economic planning via a central bank currency board. This is going to be the main theme here, the failure of central planning and that the nations that do it are committing economic suicide. The central bank currency board that pegged and regulated the ratio of dollars to pesos, the idea being that this imposed ratio would limit the risk of inflation. This was folly. Politicians are experts at working around their own supposed limitations if it proves expedient. Rather than paying off the debt and restoring creditworthiness amongst their lenders, the government skirted the limitation by borrowing dollars offshore. This financed increased government spending while freeing the central bank to issue more pesos due to the increased dollars on hand. However, given Argentina's reputation, this new debt came at a much higher risk premium, meaning higher monthly interest payments with the government showing no concern with ever paying, it was only a matter of time before the marginal payment became too much. In 2001, default arrived and a new economic crisis ensued. The results of this journey left Argentina right back where it started, growing debt obligations and dwindling means to repay them. Inter interestingly, Argentina post-2001 monetary policies have been applauded by many mainstream monetary many in the mainstream monetary community, notably Paul Krugman. Current President Christina Kirchner even referenced Krugman's praise in a speech she made in as early as 2012. Krugman is a staunch advocate of the Keynesian school, which supports direct economic intervention via central banks or central economic planners to stimulate economic growth. By stimulation, he means borrowing more money to spend more money. The hope result is an increase in aggregate demand, the lack of which he cites as the cause to economic woes. Unfortunately, it's not just Argentina who's been following the Keynesian model of borrowing more in order to spur economic recovery. That is precisely what the government of the United States has been doing as well, albeit in a more per privileged position given the dollar's world reserve currency status. Yet the essence is the same. As Argentina did pre and post 2001, so the U.S. has done pre and post 2008, increased its debt in the name of recovery with no regard given to how it will be repaid. Argentina should serve as a prime example to the U.S. and other indebted sovereign states of where such policies end up. Default. It might be tempting to think that since defaults happen so, fr so frequently that they must not be a big deal, this could not be further from the truth. Defaults carry devastating economic consequences and not just to creditors who are left holding the bag. Due to the interdependent nature of the financial system, the failure to pay always comes with collateral damage. In sovereign debt defaults, it is the citizenry that bears the brunt of the pain. It is the Argentine people who are suffering the most. Default means devaluation. Devaluation first occurs in government debt, which is discounted to account for the government's inability to pay. Next, it moves into the national currency. After all, if the bonds, which are redeemable in pesos, prove to be worthless because Argentina can't pay, then what are the pesos worth? I'm going to skip a little bit about the devaluation of the peso. The definition of insanity. Argentina's central planners have pursued a slew of defunct monetary policies of the Keynesian, monetarist, and mercantilist variety. Repeated default is the fruit of that labor. Today, spendthrift governments who betray the trust of their creditors are the new normal. Over-indebtedness followed by default is becoming commonplace. It has been creeping up in the U.S. from Detroit to Jefferson County and soon perhaps the entire Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory. In a free world, no one in their right mind would give their hard-earned capital to Western governments. Sadly, we do not live in a free world. There is not a free market for money or credit in Argentina or the U.S. 
Guided by unfair laws and insidious regulations, people continue to entrust their wealth to institutions that are actively betraying them, promising to pay out in worthless, devalued paper. A refuge still remains for investors. I'm not going to read that because you know what it is, gold and silver. Now let's look at another article here about Spain. Because almost all of Europe, at least the EU nations, are also these Keynesian central planners, socialist, communists, whatever you want to call them, uh, failures that are committing economic suicide. Now, Spain, of course, is pursuing the policy that the United States has become the world leader in, and that is just simply lying and obfuscating because their policies have led to near dis destitution for large parts of the population. We're going to see that when we look at the economic statistics, but let's read this article by Don Quixote's freelance writer, Barcelona, Spain. Uh, Case it down with these words, which roughly translate F them. The Spanish member of parliament, Andrea Fabra, greeted her party leader, Mariano Rajoy's parliamentary announcement in July 2012 of new cuts in unemployment benefits. Unbeknownst to Fabra, all three of her words were caught on camera in predictable fashion. The video went viral, sparking a wave of indignation as well as an online petition for her resignation. But Fabra, the proud daughter of a jailed former big shot of the governor, governing People's Party, refused to yield. She offered no public apology, instead dispatching a handwritten letter to the head of the chamber in which she lamented her inappropriate choice of words. Now, two years on, Fabra's inappropriate choice of words have taken on a chillingly prophetic edge. Granted, there can be no telling whether the target of her wrath was really the unemployed or whether it was, as she claims, the main opposition party, the PSOE. Either way, she got what she wanted. The PSOE is to use her term EFT as voters flee its sinking ship, and so too are Spain's unemployed, all 4.4 million of them. 40% of whom now have no official source of income. BS jobs and eternal internships. Also effed are growing ranks of Spanish workers and particularly the youngest. Ultimately, it is they who have borne the brunt of the economic fallout from Spain's real estate crash and the Troika imposed internal devaluation that followed in its wake. In newly reformed Spain, it is they who must eke out a precarious existence on the margins in the meager scraps provided by the BS temporary jobs and eternal internships, and it is they who will have to pay off the government's debt, ha, as well as their support their parents and their grandparents through their retirements, ha. Exactly how are they supposed to do this is anyone's guess, especially given their current financial malaise. If lucky, they might one day earn the minimum wage many will earn less. As for job security, there is none. Nine out of 10 new job contracts are temporary, and in most professional sectors, the proportion of temporary contracts has already doubled the EU average. And what's more, over 40% of young Spanish workers are overqualified for the jobs they hold, while eight out of 10 millennials, that is those between ages 16 and 30, continue to live with their parents. As for the lucky brave few who strike out on their own, most of them must cough up more than half of their income on rent, even for shared accommodation. In the government's alternate reality, things could not be rosier. Quote, we are on a, on a solid ground, Rejoy recently said. The recovery is here for good. What he failed to mention was the main reason for this supposed improvement, namely that more and more Spaniards are falling into bad old habits, egged on by the government and media. They are once again buying lots of foreign manufactured goods they probably don't need with the money they don't have. And it goes on, but it is a disaster. And all of Europe is a disaster. And I wanted to show you that and do a comparison here. There's a couple of articles I'm going to show you on the difference between the benefits that people have in Europe. And if you if you remember, maybe five or ten years ago, I tried to find the articles, but I couldn't find them. But if you remember five, ten, or fifteen years ago, you'd constantly hear in the in the media how much better workers had it in Europe than workers in America. And there still, to this day, that's 
some of it's true, but there are fewer and fewer workers who actually have those benefits. So this is an article that is about Asia. Now, for one thing, when we compare these things, for example, this chart here is a comparison of paid holidays, and we'll get to that in a second. But what, what you'll notice here is the only Asian nation included is Japan. And that's something you see constantly. And I had to dig and find the economic charts on my own because they refuse to compare the bankrupt Western socialist nations with the rising Asian economies. They don't want people to know, so they don't have them in the comparison. But here's an article I found that compares Asia. Asia has the most vacation deprived workers. Asia has some of the world's most demanding bosses according to a survey results from Expedia's 2012 vacation survey. Employees in the region are the most vacation deprived with employees continuing to take the fewest days off and work the longest week. The most workaholic countries are South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan with employees clocking in a staggering average of 44 hours a week. I wish I could only work 44 hours a week. When it comes to vacation time, Japanese workers are the worst off, with the average employee taking only 5 out of 13 days off. South Korean comes in close second, with workers taking 7 out of a possible 10 vacation days. Half of respondents in Asia were uncertain if their bosses were supportive of them. Taking, you see how they're spinning it, that it's the bosses. But it's not the bosses, it's the work ethic in the country. Taking the time off with 59% of Koreans and 54% of Taiwanese topping the list. In Singapore, 36% of respondents pin the blame on their managers for hindering their holidays. The study also showed that 41% of Singaporeans either canceled or postponed their time off. And so there's a lot of propaganda here. But the point is, is that the number of vacation days in Asia is very, very low. We're going to look at the unemployment rate in Asia in a second here. But here's another one about European workers. And this gives you just an example of the attitude of people who live in what I will call socialist uh, give, give me states. Uh, that's most of the Europeans. It's an entitlement mentality. You can see here, Europeans enjoy the most vacation days per year, a study from traveling website Expedia has found, yet they also complain the most about feeling vacation deprived. The Expedia's 2013 Vacation Deprivation Study surveyed these people, etc. French workers, for example, receive an average of 30 days holiday a year and are also likely to use their full entitlement. However, interestingly, 90% of French respondents told Expedia that they didn't feel that it was enough. Well, of course. That's just ridiculous. That's like the coincidence of wants, wants and needs. That's just a stupid statement. Now, let's look at their statement about Asia. However, while workers in Asia and the U.S. have a much lower holiday entitlement, they also feel less holiday deprived, the survey found. U.S. workers receive an average of 14 holidays and took on an average of 10 of their allocated days. But in contrast to Europe's 90% dissatisfaction level, only 59% of U.S. workers said that they felt they did not get enough time off. In Asia, where there is a deeply entrenched culture of hard work and long hours. Unsurprisingly, the survey showed that some of the continent's larger economies had the lowest holiday allocation and employees were less likely to use it all. In Thailand, workers were allocated 11 days a year on average and only took eight. In Malaysia, only 12 days were given and 10 taken. But workers in Japan and South Korea, etc. So, Let's look at that chart that I referred to before. This is the paid holidays in the light blue and paid vacations in the dark blue. And you can see that here are your big offenders. And we're gonna see that when we look at the economic charts. Spain, Portugal, Germany, Austria, Belgium, and uh, Greece, Ireland. And if you look at these here, this is 35 days, okay? So that's seven weeks of vacation. That's paid vacations and paid holidays. Uh, I don't know how many of you work a full-time job. There probably aren't too many of you that have seven weeks of vacation paid every year. Now, this is a older study that is called Work and Leisure in the U.S. and compares to Europe. You can see 
annual weeks worked, you can see the US at the bottom, 46.2 out of 52 weeks, but you can see some of these here. Here's Portugal, 42, they had 7.3 weeks off, 1.4 weeks that uh, were non-holiday, and then there were holiday, and then there's sickness, and you add them up. So you can see some of these countries, they only work 40 weeks out of the 52 weeks in a year, as opposed to in the United States, 46. And I suppose the amount, again, they never show you Asia. I suppose the amount in Asia would probably be 48, 47 or 48 weeks, or 49 or 50 even, worked a year. And so let's look at some charts that I pulled here now. I don't have these in any particular order because it was too difficult to do that. So let's just go ahead and look at these charts one by one. I pulled primarily the unemployment rate from the pigs nations. I pulled pulled the unemployment rate from some Asian nations and I pulled a couple of other charts here and I just want to show you these. So I'm just going to do these in order. Here is the unemployment rate for Cambodia and the reason why I pulled up Cambodia was so that if people said well you're just looking at the big countries in Asia. No, I'm looking at Asia. You can see Cambodia has an effective unemployment rate of zero percent. Here's the unemployment rate in China. You can see it's been a steady 4% for 10 years straight. Here's the unemployment rate in Greece, 27.5%. And it's been there for quite some time. You can see uh, that is a country that is committing economic suicide. Here's the un Greek youth unemployment rate hit as high as 60%. By the way, you don't have youth unemployment rates for Asia, probably because almost all of the Asian youth are doing very, very difficult studies and becoming engineers and mathematicians. Here's Hong Kong's unemployment rate. You can see that 3% spiked up to a high of eight at one point. That's the worst unemployment they've ever seen there. Here's Italy's unemployment rate, above 12%. I suspect that number is cooked. Here's Italy's youth unemployment rate. This is what you get when you have a Keynesian centrally planned socialist economy. You have all of these protected union jobs, you have all of these benefits and time off, but there isn't enough jobs to go around. So it goes to the favored people and here's the children suffering here at a 45% unemployment rate for the youth. Here is Portugal's unemployment rate. Here's the youth unemployment rate in Portugal, nearing 40%. Here's Russia's unemployment rate. We've heard about the dire consequences of the sanctions that the US has threatened and the EU and all that stuff. Doesn't look like Russia's suffering too badly. Here is Singapore's unemployment rate, a steady rock solid 2% unemployment rate. Here's South Korea's unemployment rate, 3.5%. Here's Spain's unemployment rate, 25%. Here's Spain's youth unemployment rate, 54%. Taiwan's unemployment rate, 4%. Thailand's unemployment rate, 1%, and Vietnam's unemployment rate, 2%. So there you have it. There are the charts, and that is an example of the difference between the mentalities of people who think that someone owes them something or people who think that the way you get things is by working hard. The shift has now occurred and those people who believe in working hard and working a lot are in Asia. And those people who believe in slacking off and living off the government are in Europe, increasingly America and the rest of the bankrupt socialist Keynesian West. And you can see the numbers don't lie. These nations are committing economic suicide. Now, I wanted to just show you this video. This is an example of the type of attitude that when it spreads, it destroys entire nations. So I want you to watch this real quick here. And frustration from dozens of Clayton County parents 
who say their children are going hungry tonight after their food stamps were suddenly cut off. Fox News' Justin Gray is at the live desk with the story that is all new tonight on The Edge. Justin. Tom, state officials admit to me tonight that something went wrong down in Clayton County at the office that administers food stamps and Medicaid, but they're still not sure what. Parents tell me tonight they can't buy food without those food stamps. This food stamp card ain't got number 17 cents on it. Terry Clark says she stood in line for more than six hours at Clayton County's Human Services office because food stamp help for her six children unexpectedly ended. There's no telling my kids that we can't eat. I'm not taking no because my babies don't deserve that. Nobody kids should go hungry down here in Georgia. So there's the attitude. That's the attitude that destroys entire nations. Someone who believes that other people should feed her children and that she is owed something. This is the type of attitude that is beginning to permeate the socialist countries. It's been in Europe for a long time and we can see that Europe is now dying. Europe has, for the most part, their pockets of strength in Scandinavia and Norway, but for, for the most part, the bulk of Europe has committed economic suicide and now they are going to have I don't even know if it's going to be a collapse. It may just be some type of complete destruction of their economies and maybe going back to the Stone Age. I don't know what's going to happen in Europe. The same thing seems to be coming to the United States because this attitude of entitlement is growing. Whereas in Asia, they went through many years of deprivation and communism and horrible things like that. You can see that Asia is on the rise and the West is going down very, very rapidly. So for those reasons, I do not expect that the machinations of the Western bankers are going to succeed. I think they're going to be trumped. I think they're wrong about history. I think it's time for Asia to rise, and I think that the numbers prove that. And we'll talk to you next time.